All right. Go ahead, Chris. Um, as you guys saw that I was gone last week, I was over in the Pacific Northwest, a very beautiful area if you ever want to try to go visit. Um, but I actually was involved, um, particip not one say participatory, but more of a spectator and really close by to the uh, Seattle-Tacoma Airport. Uh, what they're calling it a cyber attack, but there's still some speculation of what's going on, and this is going really beyond the headlines. So um, my wife has asked me to try to kind of turn off the cybersecurity things, but I'm still kind of in that situational awareness thing. So I get a pop-up saying Seattle, um, Tacoma's airport was hit by a cyber attack even before it, went, it hit the headlines on it. And I was like, oh, cool. So I followed the Twitter account of Seattle Tech and the local Seattle news station that I'm familiar with. And the coverage was pretty cool on the Seattle side. I'm just shocked it never got up further nationally as quickly as possible for it to be a cyber attack. The first thing I noticed is when I came, when I landed in Seattle Tacoma's airport, it's still under construction. It's still being built up. So a lot of things were scattered. Like if your baggage came down, you're in a basement that's still under construction. And grabbing your bag was grabbing our bags was interesting to say the least, because we had to go walk through different hallways and constructions to grab the bags. But then mm -hmm. coming back from Seattle, my wife and I were a little bit scared because we were reading through the reports of people going ahead and leaving but don't have their bags coming back. And that was the biggest concern. When my wife and I went to Seattle, Tacoma to come back to D.C., I don't know how many of you are familiar with how airports were back in the 80s before digital signage. There was no digital signage whatsoever. You, you, when you walk into an airport, that's the first thing you look for is the arrivals and departure boards. Right. Those were completely black. And that got me a wow. That, that system is actually connected to the network. And I didn't believe that at first because I thought that would might have been more of a internal kind of thing. But the ticketing system, it was back up and running by the time we were there. But it was it wasn't the normal ticketing you get with a ticket, it was just a printout sheet of what your flight was and what gate you go to. And then there's pictures of employees in the airport with using paper and markers to tell you what gates are and two employees standing right there telling you, okay, there's a gate change, that sheet is wrong, you need to go to gate D5 or something like that. And I just was amazed of how the CPAC employees were handling it and all the different airlines were handling it. Um, was told it was much more chaotic the two days before and when it happened, but just to have that experience of what it was before the digital signage was amazing. Um, interesting, to say the least. Um, but that was my cybersecurity news experience <laughs> as close as yeah. I can get to it without being full attractive, uh, full, very full attraction to the the actual being involved in the incident response in it, but just right. watching it from afar. It was kind of neat. Did you see customers getting frustrated? Not the day I was there. More that I heard news reports of people being frustrated and uh -huh. the interviews over on um, the Seattle station I was listening to. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. That's good. Otherwise, yeah. the day I was there, it was, hey, go this way, hey, go that way, and then everybody just kind of fell through and accepted it. I haven't checked to see if they've uh, resolved it yet or not. Yeah. Last time I checked, it still has not been resolved. That was yeah. two days ago. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank, good stuff. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll do a little share, a couple quick little things with me. Um, I, I don't know if any of you know this, but I am an amateur radio operator, a ham licensee. And um, the uh, National Association for Amateur Radio in America is called the ARRL, 
Well, the, in uh, May, they, ARRL was hit by a ransomware group, and uh, through the grapevine, we heard they paid a million dollars to this ransomware group in order to get their stuff back, uh, back up and running. So um, it's real. It, it happens. So just be aware that we we need to help people all around us understand that the stuff is not way over there. And, oh, I'm so little, it doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. Your account matters. Your account can be used um, by malicious actors. And that's why we need to help encourage everyone to participate and be educated. So that's your role, what we call being the local resident security expert uh, for your spheres. You're probably the smartest one in your family, so teach your family. You're probably the smartest one in your HOA, so teach your HOA, you know, etc. That that's um, that's something that you should feel partially responsible for um, some of the things that are going on because you know how to help prevent them. And if you don't share and people get hurt or, or lose their life savings or whatever, uh, you know, people could look at you and go, you know, didn't you know how to? So just, just my suggestion. <laughs> um, uh, one other thing for me, and I'm sharing it on my screen now. Uh, this Wednesday, I'm starting my next class at the Green Valley Recreation Center. Right now, I have seven people signed up, including the program manager from Green Valley Rec. In other words, the guy that handles all of the courses, he signed up for this one. So that's, that's kind of a, a compliment uh, to me. But this is the things that I'm covering. And if you notice, there's nothing special about these. Nothing. Um, the one, if you go down on week two, how to spot and identify malicious emails or texts. You know, look on the, the address bar, you know, where it says to me and expand that little down carrot and take a look at it and say, if it says it's from Ace Hardware, is it coming from acehardware.com? If not, consider it to be suspicious. Those sorts of things. Very simple, but a lot of people don't take a look. They say, well, it says Ace. Well, yeah, anybody can say Ace in their description and not be Ace. So that's the sort of thing that, that is kind of easy to, to teach. Uh, but then there's like, don't delete those malicious emails. I did that on purpose because people are like, what? Don't delete them? That's right. Report them. Report them as spam at the very minimum because, you know, you could help someone else. If enough people report an email, let's say one specific email, if it's sent to you, you can bet it's being sent to a thousand other people as well. So if enough people mark the exact same message as spam, I know that Google has said they will consider pulling it from everybody's inbox, for example. So you help in the prevention of this when you see it by marking it as spam. And so that, that's why I say don't delete those malicious emails because it gets them talking and it gets them thinking. So. Uh, these are just some of the, the good things that, that I teach. Down at the week three, you notice week three is the busy week. Multi-factor authentication and pass keys and pass phrases. Um, but, and then I arrange them in terms of how secure they are. And I basically say uh, pass keys are the best. Multi-factor authentication is second best. Pass phrases are the third best, and what I mean by passphrase, is a really long password. If you've got to use a password, make it 20 characters long, not 8 to 12. Make it 20 characters long, and make it into a phrase that you'll remember. And then on my screen, I say, there is no option number four. In other words, do 
one of these three, don't leave it at your regular password. Beef up all of your passwords if you do nothing else. And I teach them how to do that. So, uh, and then down at the bottom, week four, good online safety practices. I, I teach them about threat actors and how some people do things and they're patient about it and other people really push you to do things because all they want to do is get your money and leave and and they're they have different motivations and that can help you understand how you may be in the process of being exploited so and then I talk about cyber safety in the home most people don't know that it's a good security practice to reboot your internet router every three to six months. Pull the plug, let it sit for 30 seconds, and plug it back in because that puts it back to factory settings. And I think we may have discussed this. There was an ISP where 500,000 of their routers were compromised. One particular ISP, I think it, I don't even remember the name of the ISP, but their routers were all compromised, and people stopped getting internet. Well, how do you ship out new routers to nearly all of your customers? That was a massive undertaking. So, you know, teach people good security practices. Every couple months, go reboot your router. Why? so that your router doesn't get compromised. It can be. It's out on the Internet. And that's what you teach people around you. Um, I'm going to start, for example, in the class, I'm going to start with, uh, I call them icebreaker questions. What's your longest password length? And whoever has the longest one gets a prize. When was the last time you rebooted your Internet router? And if, you know, whoever did it the most recently gets a prize. So I'm trying to teach them in a positive way how to take care of themselves. So I'm doing that. Um, just fun stuff like that. It, it's just what I enjoy doing to help people understand that they can do something about this. Make sense? Anybody have any comments? Nerman? Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, how many hours are you going to teach uh, per, per week? This class is a total of four hours. It's one hour each week over the course of four weeks. I'm teaching Wednesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. And in a week one, week two, week three, week four, those are the four Wednesdays in September. And then I'm teaching it again in November, the same class. And I have seven people signed up for that one already as well. That's amazing. I mean, um, the things that you're going to do, I, in my opinion, I mean, I, I recently was thinking about this, and I think this is the most important part of cybersecurity for end users, to educate them, to teach them how they can protect themselves from uh, yeah, know, bad actors and 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 you know, bad I mean bad people. Um, right. And I was just thinking, like, uh, I mean, every day I, I, I'm just listening to those stories, like where like people just click on uh, getting phishing emails and they click on the link and you know the the, the whole system was compromised because of that and or uh, you know all those servers. Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, we heard the story like people losing like millions of millions of dollars. Like I recently heard the story where uh, I, I I don't want to say which company because we are record, recording right. this, but um, the vice president of one mm -hmm. company he received one email, phishing email, only one email, one link. He clicked on the link. And that was disaster. So I would just say that they lost millions of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So the one one section of of the, of the like infrastructure like was uh, erased, like disappeared, and it took them like 
months of months to rebuild everything. And they didn't have backups, <laughs> by the way. Right. So I, I was just thinking, like, only one email, only one link destroyed, like, everything. So th that's why I actually yep. bring to, to make this uh, YouTube video. Like, I think this is really important. Like, e e even it's simple. It's really simple. Like, like you said, like, mm -hmm. nothing special. Like, you know, but actually it's really special. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that um, socially they think that the more connections they get, the more respected they are, or the the you know more credibility they have, or whatever. So they they try and get all of these connections, and some of those connections are not people who have their best interests in heart in mind. So you end up setting yourself up when you do things like leave old accounts out there or um, you know friend and like everybody that asks you I get a lot of people um, over on LinkedIn that they're like hey I'm a I'm an internet marketer from you know Jodhpur India I, okay I'm not gonna I'm not gonna connect up with them they're not going to give me anything. They're contacting me because they want my business, and I'm not going to give it to them. So, you know, value your connections more than just the number, the count of people. Make sure that when you connect with somebody that Oh, and this is something else that's going on in Facebook. I think you guys may have seen this. People clone Facebook accounts into new Facebook accounts. So let's say it's your um, your HOA president. All of a sudden, a new account that looks just like the old one that says, you know, please join. This is your, you know, hi, I'm your HOA president or whatever. But it's not. It's a cloned account from someone else who is masquerading as your HOA president. And so you've got this one account that you have already had correspondence with, and then another one pops up that should automatically make you suspicious. That's how, you know, that's how you should talk to people around you. If I already have an account with you, we're, we're friends and we correspond, and then you get a notification that Scotty Ward wants to connect with you. Well, Scotty Ward is already connected with you. This is a cloned account, and it's not there for any good reason. Somebody wants to, you know, do something and hide their identity, and they're using my identity to hide behind. People don't think about that. They're like, oh, you want to join? Okay. Oh, let's be friends. Okay. Well, no, exercise a little discretion, I guess, is a good word to use. Make sense, everybody? And that's what you should be teaching your family and friends. Just play it smart. Play it smart online. You know, the winner is not the person with the most friends. The winner is not the person who gets the most emails. Ooh, I get 200 emails a day. I must be important. No. <laughs> Make sense? Yeah, Chris, quality over quantity, always. And, and here's another thing you may not think about. If you know someone, let's say, you know, a lot of people know me because I've been out in LinkedIn for 20 plus years. A lot of people know me. And if I accept a friend request from someone and then uh, someone else looks for that someone, it says, hey, Scotty Ward and this person are already connected. That is using my name as validation for this person that I connected with. They say, oh, well, Scotty connected with them, so it must be okay, right? So, you know, value your reputation. Make sense? Okay. So, um, 
uh, along with that, I did want to do a little bit of sharing. I think you guys saw the uh, information about CISA's new cyber incident reporting portal. I hope you read the article on it. Here's what's happening in uh, America. It's starting in America. There are, I think it's 16 different things that they consider to be critical infrastructure. One of them is like power. One of them is water. One of them is um, emergency services. One is banking. You know, those sorts of things. Those are all considered to be critical infrastructures. And the federal government is trying to help these critical infrastructures become more um, resistant to bad stuff going on online. Um, and so they're trying to get best practices. They're trying to uh, help increase awareness. They're trying to, you know, co help people collaborate among themselves, etc. But this new bill, I think there's a bill for this. It basically says that if you do business with the federal government, specifically in in uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, components, if you do business with the federal government, you are going to be required to do things over and above if you're just doing stuff for, let's say, the city of Phoenix. So they are, they are getting to a point within the next month and a half, I think, they're, they're, these people, these companies that are in critical infrastructures, like power, like um, emergency services like water, they are all going to be required by law to report stuff. And it, it, it's going to be very tough for them. So what CISA did is they started with this incident reporting portal. And they said, you know, start with this. Start by sharing. We'll show you how to do it. This is a very low pressure approach, but in the end, this is going to be mandatory for anybody that does business with the U.S. government, and that includes the military, that includes, you know, Department of Labor, that includes OSHA, that includes um, FDIC, you know, any federal government entity that your organization interoperates with, you got any student loans? Guess what? You're interoperating with the Department of Education because your student loans could have been federally guaranteed. Uh-oh. So, so now you are involved with the federal government. So the see, this is the difference between a democratic society and a um, socialist or communist society. In a socialist or communist society like Canada, like um, Australia, like Great Britain, it's a labor government, like India, like North Korea, Russia, you know, they are all uh, arranged in a manner where the government can demand that they do things. The socialist semi-socialist um, or communist countries, they can say, well, the government owns the electricity, so you have to do this if you get electricity from us. In America, where it's a capitalist society, democratically voted people, it's not so, um, it's not so clear cut. They can't make you do things unless there are laws enacted that do that. So it's a little different when you're here, like in America, compared to places where the government can say, you gotta do it, period. Um, so they're trying to start with a low key approach here. This is the CISA Cyber Incident Reporting Portal. I'm gonna do a little more research on it. I'm gonna start reporting incidents through it Please feel free to do the same for yourself because they say if you are um, if you receive an, a cyber incident and we all know 
come on, people, tell me, what is it called when somebody receives a spam or phishing email or message text? What's it called in cyber terms? Nope. Uh, I, yes, Chris, it is an event, but in in reference to the type of event it is. Come on, mentees. Twyla, I think you've said it a couple times with me. It's called a false negative. False negative. And it basically says that this stuff went through a mail filter that was supposed to stop it, and it didn't. The mail filter said this is not an event, and it passed it down to your inbox. That is a false negative. The mail system forwarded something it wasn't supposed to. Okay, And you need to be able to speak about this if you're on the incident response team. And by the way, this is the last day that you can report stuff for the month of August and get credit for the month of August. Twyla, I see that you've done it. Uh, Anderson, I see that you've done it. Uh, Samson, I'm not sure if you have. Nerman, you haven't. But um, if you want credit as an incident response analyst for the month of August, you got to get those reports in. Okay, today. Um, that you know, ju that's just my <laughs> statement to you guys. But um, the government is getting to a point where this reporting portal is going to be mandatory. There's going to be laws. There's going to be penalties for people who don't do that. So just be aware, we're learning about this ahead of it becoming mandatory for critical infrastructure um, components, like you know, your power and light company. Your, the people who give you electricity to your house are going to be required to use this. So it's helpful for you to learn about it, for example. Make sense? Anybody else have any uh, something to say uh, on that matter? Okay. Uh, last thing I'm going to cover, because we only have a, a couple minutes left, uh, can everybody see the uh, the diagram that I have? Is it big enough for you? There we go. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the incident response life cycle. Because this, if you're a member of the incident response team, and we all should be, if you're a member of the incident response team, you should know about this. Number one, right in the center, it says incident response team. You are right at the center of this activity, all right? That's where you are, the gray center. Where it says incident reporters, the red, that is the people who forward you their spam and phishing messages. Or you yourself are an incident reporter. When you see it, you, you send it in. So number one, you could be a reporter and you could be a member of the incident response team, okay? Then we talk about internet service providers, the green on the right. What if you are speaking with someone and they forward you their spam or phishing messages? You should inform them to say, yes, I'm going to report this, but now you should block the sender and report it as spam or phishing if you have Outlook. That means that that they are um, also responding as other incident response teams. They're in invoking protections for that specific instance. So they, they're your customers. Um, they, are, they could be other incident response teams if you're teaching them what to do. If you just say thank you and you report it, you're not teaching them, okay? When we report, we report it down to the blue one, which is law enforcement. There, now, it's law enforcement or corporate enforcement. Like if you do it straight to Amazon, you do it straight to um, uh, PayPal, you do it straight to, um, what's the other one? Uh, Harbor Freight. 
was another one. They say, send us this stuff. Um, so though law enforcement or corporate enforcement. So we are involved in this entire life cycle and don't sell it short. This is important stuff. I was watching uh, last evening about how all this stuff is going on at the national level and they have incident response teams. They have customer training teams. They have all of this client education stuff. Okay, but who's educating the public? No one or very few. That's what you do. That's why you should feel responsible for people in your sphere of influence that you can help them get smarter so they are down at the bottom in the red. They are the incident reporters or in the upper left, they are the customers. Okay? You teach them that they have a part to play in this life cycle. You are providing that education. You are providing that avenue for them to do the reporting. And you teach them after they've reported it to you to mark it as spam. Don't just delete it. So you have educated them how to slow down this from occurring again from the same senders. And the more senders we block, the better it becomes. The harder it becomes for these people to get to us, us meaning society. We start fighting back. And it takes everyone to do that. Does that make sense, everybody? You have a part to play. You're not just, you know, doing mu boring, mundane stuff. Yes, it's boring, but it's for a purpose. You are helping to make this world a better place by making things uncomfortable for the people who are out there trying to steal things that don't belong to them. Does that make sense, everybody? Yes. Any thoughts before we finish up? I'm all done. Any thoughts? Okay, please get your reports in today. Even if it's just one, that allows you to claim credit for the month of August. Okay, Samson. Yeah, I I remember when you were doing the walkthrough for this uh, incident reporting. You 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 went to a website to upload the links which this malicious link to just verify if this website is even credible or not. Do you remember the link? Or? Um, the, the only one that I remember doing to verify was Talos Intelligence. Okay. And that's from Cisco. Um, I think it's a com. Let's see. Yep, Talos Intelligence. No, Cisco. Yeah, there it is. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Talos Intelligence. Oops. Talos Intelligence. Oh, I got rid of the whole thing. There we go. Talos Intelligence. That's the only one that I use. Um, I, I really don't get too deeply into the um, trying to determine if it's good or bad. What I do is I look at it and say, is it, you know, um, is if it says it's from Amazon.com, then they can claim to be Amazon. But if it says it's from, you know, Amazon Prime at EU.com, that's not Amazon Prime. See what I'm saying? That's as far as I go. There is enough work to do without getting, you know, that much deeper into it. I'm trying to help the public realize that they have a role to play in this. Um, so I, I only deal with the very initial stuff. I agree, you should learn about this. But start also by trying to get people in your sphere of influence smarter. Teach them the simple stuff. 
Yeah, uh, because the reason why I asked for this was sometimes you get some emails and you you expect some similar emails. You look the website it looks kind of credible, but you're not really sure. Just you just want to verify that link first before you then click. Right. The right. Um, that's called the reputation, and uh, I just put the link on that as well. Uh, if you are looking at the the Talos. Um, website um, look for reputation okay. and and they're basically saying have people reported this to be a nasty place uh, and oh by the way you can also report things I have reported things through Talos intelligence you have to get a Cisco account but there are they're free you can get a free Cisco account and then you can open what are called tickets and watch what happens with your ticket. It's really interesting to do. And you can say, you know, this link, uh, go. it's reported to be from, you know, Home Depot, but it goes to a phishing collection site. And I want to report it as being malicious. Yeah, you can do that on the Talos website. And they will... Uh, review your ticket and they will come back and say things like uh, insufficient data to make any changes or what I like we've updated this website status to possibly malicious or something like that you know the reputation is good no the reputation is now possibly malicious yes I help to make that happen that's fun that's fun but you gotta, you know, you gotta know what you're looking at, and you have to be able to test the links. That's why you need a sandbox. If you're running Windows 10 or Windows 11 Pro, you can do that sandbox, virtual machine, because you're going to be going out to what could be questionable websites. So you got to be really careful about that. So. Yeah, you're going into the testing part, Samson, and that is really good, but be aware, you have to protect yourself as well. And so I recommend you do it from a a, a sandbox or a virtual machine. Okay? Okay. Yeah, because I also noted that you could also report IP addresses. Yes, you can. Yep. IP addresses, URLs. Domain names, you can report them all on that w- website reputation report center. Nerman, go ahead. Oh, I just want to add something. Hey, um, yeah, um, Samson, whatever you do, make sure you don't do it on your personal device. So I, I know it's so hard, like, so not everyone has, like, more than one device, like, but you know if you can use some um laptop or something like and make sure that you you're not doing on the same network uh because you can easily get infected and you you might not even know that so when you yep. um opening those emails uh phishing emails if you're trying to 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 test the the attachment or the link uh instead of only just making report like you, you can easily infect your your system. So be careful. Like I suggest, yep. you to not do that on your personal device and your like home network. Um, yeah, you 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 can really mess up. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks, now So because I thought about that, so I was like, if I'm gonna try something like that, probably with another laptop and maybe another router, so it it does not. Has to be. Yeah, make sure that you don't have any files and anything on that laptop. And right, um, right. I mean, yeah. If you if you don't have Windows 11 Pro, you will not be able to use Sandbox. But you can easily go to download for free Virtual Box, and you right. can download any uh, operating system, Windows or Linux, and you go there. You log into your email, or you just from your email, download the, or just 
copy and paste the 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 attachment on on uh, on home page yep. whatever and then then you can you can play uh you can test it there yeah and yeah but sandbox is the best one sandbox once you close the sandbox it will clear up everything yeah it's gone but a virtual yep. machine no like so whatever you make there it will stay there so make sure to you know to clean up and can you access the sandbox freely, or is that open source? Or uh, do you have the pro version of Windows, Samson? I have. Oh uh, yeah, I have the pro version of Windows. Okay. 11. So uh, you can do Windows Sandbox. Uh, take a look on YouTube. There are a number of people that tell you how to set that up. You have to just enable. So just Google how to enable yep. Sandbox on Windows 11 Pro. It's yep. it's one click. Once you enable, you can just make shortcut on your, uh, you know. Um, well, there you go, that, Chris. Chris just dropped it into the link into our chat. And remember, team, anything that's put in the chat, you need to capture it now because it it's gone when we're when we're done here. So if we put stuff in the chat. Click on it and then go to it later. I will emphasize Nerman and what Scotty is saying. Please do it on a virtual machine or on a laptop that you don't have anything sensitive on. Yeah, and if it is, and uh, I heard Nerman say not on a virtual machine. What Chris and I are referring to is a virtual machine that you initialize each time, not a virtual machine with any sort of um, uh, permanence meaning Windows 11 that you're doing this on. Right. Okay. So you can start with the easy stuff. Teach people around you to look where it says to me and take a look at it and say, if it doesn't say it's coming from this bank, then it's not. And and they should consider that suspect. And they can forward it to you, and you can do some research on it and say, thank you, you know, don't, you know, block sender, report as spam. And then you report it to your authorities, Federal Trade Commission, your um, fraud, uh, police fraud there in the UK, Samson, I put that link out there. Um, play a part. It may sound like a little thing, but when we all work together, it will make a difference. Okay? All right. That's it for the day. Thank you, everybody. Hope you all have a great Saturday and a wonderful American holiday weekend. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> okay. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye.